Um, today's a special day. Today's our uh, uh, Robert Sess Symposium, Distinguished Lecture. Um, each year we've had this, uh, I think, 16 years now, uh, going back to even when Bob was here for, uh, uh, for a while. But we, we've had this to honor uh, the numerous contributions of uh, Distinguished Professor Emeritus uh, Bob Sess to not only Stony Brook, but all of atmospheric sciences. Um, uh, Bob was a professor here for many years, I think from the late 60s, or early 2000s. Uh, and originally back in uh, a main campus in engineering uh, for many years before the group moved down here, a small group in the early 1990s. Um, so Bob has yeah, made numerous contributions uh, in terms of radiant transfer, the greenhouse effect, climate models, and intercomparison of climate models, uh, and was very distinguished in that community. And so forth. Um, and he's also, uh, needless to say, one of the founders of atmospheric science uh, here at Stony Brook. Um, uh, back in, like I mentioned, when they were originally in, in engineering and so forth. So um, I actually spoke to Bob briefly yesterday. He's doing, uh, he's doing uh, well. Uh, he's nursing a, a broken ankle, unfortunately, right now. Uh, so he's not as mobile as he used to be. But he's in high spirits, and he sends everyone's uh, regards and warm wishes and so forth. Um, each year, as a result, uh, we have a, we invite a distinguished lecturer to come here and uh, and, uh, and and talk to us. And there's usually some connection with uh, with Bob, either in terms of a personal connection, mentoring, or research. Uh, so it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Dr. Richard Bertuno, who's a senior uh, scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder. And so. Uh, uh, one direct connection is that uh, uh, Dr. Rotuno got his bachelor's and master's degree here at Stony Brook uh, in, uh, in engineering, uh, master's in mechanics. Uh, and I learned this morning, I didn't know this, he actually had four, four classes with Bob since. So not just one, two, three, but four classes. Uh, so uh, so very, they were very close to the very small department. Very small. <laughs> um, and so, uh, and then uh, he uh, 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 got his uh, PhD at GFDL Princeton, uh, and then uh, uh, ended up at NCAR, working up through the ranks and serving numerous administ administrative roles, including uh, uh, the, the ASP fellowship program, and so forth there. Uh, Rich, uh, Dr. Rutuna has made numerous contributions to mesoscale meteorology uh, from severe storms. Uh, those of us teaching those classes, uh, you know, we bring up the RKW theory, right? Well, he's the R uh, in terms of uh, Rutuno, Clem Weissman. Uh, uh, tropical cyclones, orographic flows, precipitation, uh, you name it. And uh, as a result, he's won numerous awards. I would spend a whole hour listing them, uh, but uh, I, I, a couple nice ones from AMS, so the Jewel Charney Award in 2004, and then more recently, in 2017, the, the Carl Gustav Rossby Medal, which is the highest award in AMS. So with that, it's my pleasure, although I want to give you, uh, I forgot to bring it up, we have a plaque here in recognition of uh, Dr. Rotuno's outstanding contribution to atmospheric science. We have this plaque here for the Robert Distinguished Professor Lecture. So. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here today, especially at the, uh, the Sess Symposium. Uh, as Brian mentioned, I had uh, four courses with Bob Sess. Uh, Bob was an excellent teacher. Uh, he, uh, his lectures were always clear, crystal clear. Uh, the tests were always on his lecture material, slight variation from his lecture material. Uh, I always found them uh, just refreshing to be able to uh, take the course, take the exam, and not expect uh, any, any surprises and just 
it was, it was straightforward. And, uh, I have many recollections, very, very you know, positive rec recollections about Bob. And uh, um, sorry, couldn't be here today, but I understand you're uh, recording it. Is, and so, uh, if you are, uh, yeah, I hope Bob appreciates this. So uh, today's uh, subject uh, that I'm, this is what I'm currently working on, but but I've been I've been kind of working on this area for 30 years in a way. So I, it's one of the uh, you know, Brian mentioned the number of topics that I've worked on, and so it's been a kind of a potpourri of things that I kind of come back to peri periodically. And uh, this is one that uh, is kind of uh, close to my heart because it's uh, it's kind of a neat problem, I think. So. Uh, let me uh, jump right into it. This is what we're uh, we're thinking about here: atmospheric lee vortices. And uh, as you'll see from the images here, um, this is a uh, these are islands, the Canary Islands here. Let me see if I can. Yeah, these are the Canary Islands in this area here. And you can see that uh, uh, this, you know, they're from the low-level stratus clouds. Uh, this. Uh, this example shows that there's usually cold, stable marine air flowing past uh, relatively tall mountains, and they produce these uh, organized wakes, uh, things with uh, things that look like Barn Carmen vortices uh, in the wake. Here's another example from an island off of Baja, uh, uh, offshore island off of Baja. Again, very kind of a dense marine stratus cloud layer uh, flowing past the island, and you notice the clearing and the organized eddies that are uh, flowing downstream. Another example uh, is from the island of Hawaii, uh, looking down uh, from above from the space shuttle. Uh, we see there's uh, the trade winds that are uh, have these uh, characteristic uh, cloud streets uh, that, that pretty much indicate the, the direction of the uh, of the uh, of the flow. And the flow is impinging on the island and appears to be separating and uh, forming uh, lee, uh, lee vortices. And uh, if, uh, if the cloud images aren't convincing enough, uh, there, there was actually a field experiment uh, to uh, map out the, uh, the flow in the wake of the island of Hawaii. So, uh, so yeah, there are these, uh, there are these. Uh, uh, wake vortices, and they seem to be fairly ubiquitous around the world. So uh, some 30 years ago, uh, my colleague at NCAR, Piotr Smolakevich, he was uh, working on doing numerical simulations of uh, flow around the Hawaii. And um, he uh, came to me one day and said, well, you showed me the evidence of that these vortices exist in nature, and they typically occur under very stably stratified flow. And uh, the prevailing theory at the time was, well, the stable stratification um, allows the air to, uh, to kind of flow. If this is the obstacle here. This is why. So the allows the air to flow around the obstacle, and, but is restrained to, to not deflect much in the vertical. So they just kind of flex around, and there'll be frictional rubbing, which would produce these eddies in more or less two-dimensional sheets. So I suggested to him, one of the things you can do with the numerical model is if you do a thought experiment, so why don't we take away the frictional effect and we should see these eddies go away. So he came back in the next day and he said, well, the, the eddies didn't go away and they became much stronger. And uh, so I said, well, maybe there's a bug in your model. And he, <laughs> he said, no, in this Polish accent, no, there's no bug in my model. <laughs> so. Uh, I said, okay, well, uh, maybe there's something we haven't considered yet. And so uh, some clue had to do with the, uh, with the stratification, you know, the density stratification. And uh, you know, there's a source of vorticity there. And so uh, with the density stratification, we know that when you bend surfaces up or down, then they tend to be restored to the horizontal. And that means there's, there's, there's rotation in the fluid doing that restoration. So uh, this is the model we came up with. Um, that if you now, if you look at a flow, stratified flow, here are two isotropes uh, flowing along, uh, impinging on a, on, a, on a ridge here. They tend to bend up first, and then they bend down. 
And as they bend down, the, there is a baroclinic generation of vorticity. This is basically, think of cool air sinks and warm air rises. Right? So this is, this is the cool, the tendency of the sinking motion is to have a generation like this. And I'm trying to make the motion with my arrow here. And the tendency to, to rise back up is a rotation like this. So if you look at the lee side, you know, from the lee side looking upstream here, this, uh, this uh, rotation here is represented by these two, uh, this vortex, uh, this vorticity distribution. And so um, on the lee side, you tend to have a vort horizontal vorticity distribution that's pointing from, uh, from this side to this side, from, you know, from y positive to y negative in this uh, coordinate uh, system. And if you use the, uh, the right-hand rule, uh, the flow basically is trying to go around the, uh, the direction of the vorticity vector. Now, uh, Bob says, to, he said, I, think, I think I learned this from Bob, he said that um, uh, he was teaching this to a group of uh, students and uh, he was teaching about the right hand rule and many of the students were right handed and they were taking their lecture notes with their right hand and they were doing this and they weren't getting things to work out. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. <laughs> So remember to use your right hand it's, uh, it's going through this. Right hand rule. So uh, what happens is you can see that the, uh, the, the, the flow is, is sinking more rapidly directly in the lee of the obstacle than it is on the sides. It's not sinking at all on the sides. And so you get a uh, tilting effect where uh, you develop a vertical component of vorticity. And that vertical component of vorticity is exactly the, the right sense, uh, has the right sense of the dipole of vorticity that was in the numerical the simulation. Uh, we extended this uh, the theoretical idea to think of in terms of something called potential vorticity. Now, the potential vorticity uh, is uh, is the basically the dot product of the vorticity vector with the uh, the, the temperature, the potential temperature gradient, and so uh, geometrically speaking, uh, this means that if the if the potential vorticity say is zero, and which it is upstream in our numerical simulations, and if it remains zero, that means that the uh, vortex lines are parallel to the isentropic surfaces, and that they lie on the isentropic surface. So uh, we did that. We did an analysis in this paper of the uh, potential vorticity. And this uh, little picture down here, uh, this is uh, shows the vortex lines on an isentropic surface. Uh, the, the contour lines, the dark ones here, show the displacement upward of, the sur of that surface. That would be sort of this part of the flow here. With the vortex lines indicate, the sense of the lines indicated by these, uh, these little arrows. Running around the front of the hill, you know, from negative to positive y. And then coming around to the back of the hill, these dashed lines now uh, indicate a downward displacement of the isotrope. And they basically correspond to this line coming down and going back up again. Just following the isotrope down and coming back up. So we thought there was a fairly complete explanation of the, uh, the vorticity distribution in the, uh, the lead vortex. And uh, this is, uh, you know, no one had, up until this paper was written, no one had considered this other source of, uh, of, uh, of vorticity for the lead vortices. Um, yeah, uh, this is not to say that frictional, frictional effects are unimportant. It's just to say that there's another, there's another possibility, there's another source of uh, vorticity that acts in a systematic way to produce lead vortices. Okay, we were, we were kind of happy with that until uh, Ron Smith wrote a comment in our paper and said, wait a minute, you've got potential vorticity in there, you know, which, which we said. There's, uh, there are little places in the flow where, where, the, where these vortex lines disappear through the, the isotrope. And there's a steady state flow. Those little red lines where the, where it, uh, where the, the vortex lines kind of disappear and go, go beneath the surface of the isotrope. So, um, Basically, the last sentence of that paper, uh, if the PV is not zero, then that fact 
not the existence of vertical vorticity is the salient point. You know, uh, we had to scratch our heads about that. I said, well, what, is, you know, what does that mean? It's a salient point. I, I mean, nobody had considered this, vortic this mechanism of vorticity production before, and uh, we think that is the salient point. So it's like, you know, okay, so what? So, um, so then we considered, so what? Okay, so if, if it's PV is very important, um, then uh, how do you explain this experiment? This is a, now, you know, this is this experiment here, let me use this thing. This experiment here is run to steady state. Okay, so uh, in looking at uh, time evolution, uh, this, in this experiment, we look at the uh, evolution. Here's an isotropic surface. Here's an isotropic surface uh, in this color. And the coloration on the surface, just th it, this here indicates an upward displacement, blue, and downward displacements are in the, the reddish colors. Uh, the vortex lines are those lines that they adhere to the, uh, the surface. And you can see what's happening here. As we put the, the flow into motion, this is time A, B, C, D. Now as, as the flow is put into motion, this isentrope starts forming a Lie vortex right here, another one there, before, uh, before there's any potential vorticity screen. PV is zero. As long as the, the, the vortex lines stay on the isentropic surface, omega dot grad stays at zero. Okay, so that uh, it, it's zero as, as, as the vortex is forming. So if the potential vorticity is so important, why is, why is the vortex formed before the potential vorticity? Later, as a result of the flow that's engendered by this distribution of vorticity, the isentrope will come around and reconnect on itself. Let's take that. Here, see, as it reconnects, now you can find surfaces. This basically signifies uh, places where, where the vortex lines will appear to come out of the, you know, pierce through the isentrope, and PV is created. So the view from this is that uh, PV forms as a result of the nonlinear processes that produce the vortex, not vice versa. Yeah, the PV does not create in the vortex. So anyway, that's that's one that was one sort of dimension of the debate. Um, but the other you know, sort of dimension is well, okay. If uh, it's okay, so accepted that potential vorticity is created here. Uh, that means PV is not zero. If PV is not zero, omega is not zero. And if omega is not zero, where did the omega come from? Because the omega is also zero upstream. The vorticity is zero upstream. So that's the other, you know, okay, well, so this argument here about PV non-zero doesn't tell you where the, the omega comes from. In fact, you know, I've had this conversation, you know, personally with Ron many times. And he says, well, I don't know where it comes from. So he was basically, you know, you know neither, neither, uh, neither, neither accepted or rejected this argument. I don't know. But the important point is that there's PV. Okay, well, later, here's another take on this, is that, okay, fine, in this experiment here, you've got a, an initial condition where the mountain is poking up above an isentrope. And you put the mountain into, into, prior, into motion, and the isentrope starts to wrap in this sort of slow, majestic fashion. And yeah, okay, in that case, we can understand that uh, the, the vortex forms and PV comes later. What about this case when you have uh, wave breaking? Uh, you have wave breaking here. And this, this case here, the idea is that the wave breaking, the turbulence, that produces a, a, a reactive force. And uh, I think that's spam. <laughs> they always call me around this time. <laughs> um, yeah, re produces a force. And the baroclinic. Uh, Generation of vorticity is not is not directly germane to what's going on here. It's just a, a patch of turbulence. 
produces a backward force. And uh, therefore, and it will create potential vorticity in the stratified fluid. So there's there's your source of vorticity. Source of vorticity is unrelated to the baroclinic dynamics of the wave, and uh, it'll produce PV. And uh, so, where do these ideas come from? Uh, these basically they come from the shallow water theory, shallow water equations. And you know, just going back to the you know to the 50s and 60s, this is, this was very standard affair in uh, in geophysical fluid dynamics. Um, in uh, for certain combinations of uh, flow parameters is the two-layer shallow water equations here. Um, the uh, stratified flow, the stratified flow here, uh, theta one, theta two, uh, height of the uh, of this uh, inversion layer, height of the mountain, and for many years this is considered a very good model for downslope windstorms. There's a nice article by Dale Duran on in the Encyclopedia of Atmospheric Science on this. Um, and, uh, and so what happens in, uh, in these states is that you have a flow, uh, it undergoes a, trans a transition through uh, at the mountain crest uh, to a, crit to a uh, supercritical state, and then to adjust to downstream conditions, it undergoes a hydraulic jump. Okay, and that uh, hydraulic jump is uh, I think I learned this here at Stony Brook when I was taking my fluids courses. Uh, this was a, uh, uh, a hydraulic jump. is a flow that goes from a supercritical state to a subcritical state, and you have energy dissipation as you put, as you pass through the jump. So the idea here is that uh, we, the super supercritical state forms from the crest down to the point where the jump occurs, and then there's a subcritical state downstream. So when you run a uh, a uh, shallow water model now with a, a three-dimensional obstacle instead of a two-dimensional obstacle, you still form a hydraulic jump on the lee side. The flow that throws through the middle is accelerated because it's losing energy, and the flow that goes around the side is not. And uh, then what happens there is that you produce these uh, uh, these lines of vorticity that emanate downstream from the from this hydraulic jump, which is a dissipative feature. So here's an example of the case of, uh, no, you know, we don't, no apparent uh, baroclinic vorticity generation, there's dissipation, and, uh, and it seems that if the, uh, the, uh, the vorticity comes directly from the dissipating feature. If you look at the equations inside the shallow water, the equation, shallow water models, dissipation and potential vorticity go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. Therefore, potential vorticity, vorticity, they go together. This patient, all three go together. Okay, but let's, uh, let's think about this a minute. The, the hydraulic jump, when people do sh you know, shallow water theory, if you're in the applied math the uh, community, solutions like these are called weak solutions. And the reason they're weak solutions is because they're really not solutions. Because what happens is the shallow water theory breaks down when you form a discount, when you form very steep interfaces, and you essentially parameterize the flow at this point. So let's depend on the Rayleigh condition, and we'll do the matching condition from two sides here. This side where the shallow water equations are good, this side where they're where they're good, but in the middle they break down. And so in order to to continue your calculation, you apply a shock or a jump condition. You know, it's based on physics, but it's, but, it, but nonetheless, it's a parameterization. Uh, what, what is it parameterizing? Well, it's parameterizing uh, this, this turbulent uh, motion here, is all you know, represented by that thin line. And in that turbulent motion, there are tons of laboratory experiments. I show it has a very definite circulation. To it's a rolling motion like this. And so, um, next time you go hiking, next to a mountain stream, you may see something like this. There's a rock submerged here under the stream. It's a hydraulic jump in the back. And uh, the point of, uh, that, I, that I'm gonna develop here in this seminar is that uh, the rolling motion here 
is intimately connected to the the Lee vortex motion that you'll see in the, that we see in these simulations, which is to say, we need to understand the uh, the source of the that vorticity to understand the source of the Lee vortex vorticity. So, uh, so the issue: what's the role of uh, vorticity and potential vorticity in Lee vortices? Uh, Two-layer shallow water equations I've uh, shown you is, uh, at steady state, there's dissipation, potential vorticity is not zero, and Lee vortices. So they seem to be joined at the hip. Uh, when you do primitive equation simulations at steady state, you also see uh, non-zero potential vorticity and Lee vortices. However, if you do uh, initial value problems, you can fi you find cases and you find uh, cases where Lee vortices form without so through PV zero. So it's uh, it's unclear what uh, from this uh, what uh, you know, what it means how important PV is. So what's new today is I'm going to show you uh, analysis of the vorticity from primitive equations uh, solutions applied to quasi two le level uh, fluid at statistical steady state using direct numerical solutions of the Navier-Stokes equations. So uh, I, so just to uh, set the stage here. This is the, uh, the flow we're going to analyze. This is a, uh, a, the initial distribution of potential temperature. So the constant, layer, constant potential temperature here, constant potential temperature here, joined by a rapid increase, a 10, a 10 degree increase in potential temperature between the layers. And the idea here is that we're going to try to simulate the flow that the shallow water equations is meant to simulate, is trying to simulate as a basically Shallow water has theta one here and a theta two here, but it has a discontinuity between the two layers. But here we're going to have a, a continuous transition layer to do this uh, to do the simulation. This is more realistic, and uh, it also when you're doing a, a finite uh, difference model, finite difference models don't like discontinuities. So it's going to have a, it's going to have a, a finite, resol finite resolution over this one kilometer layer. We're going to do this over this domain with this uh, 20 meter resolution. It's going to be in the category of direct numerical simulation. So the Reynolds number is 5,000, which is small compared to atmospheric Reynolds numbers, but it's, as I'll show you, it's large enough to have a uh, credible turbulent flow. So we're going to get away from all the issues of parameterization of turbulence and wakes and do a direct analysis of the, uh, of the lead vortices that I'll show you form and I'll just I'll show you that right now. This is a what this is an isentrope. This is this lower most isentrope showing the flow set and the motion. I'll play it a couple of times. And then a turbulent wake forms in the uh, in the lead side. And uh, if you kind of look at it carefully you see this kind of drifting motion forward here, drifting motion on the side. I'll, I'll play it again. The, the initial wave breaking backward, forming these eddies, and then the, now a continual motion after that of flowing forward and breaking eddies. So uh, a few definitions, nothing fancy here. Uh, Cartesian coordinates, velocity, UVW, and uh, the vorticity in three components, chi, eta, and zeta. Uh, very standard notation. Uh, there's the vorticity, and there's the uh, flow that it's, it's a measure of the local rotation rate uh, of the fluid. Uh, I'm going to stick with the same convention all the way through here. These green lines are isentropes uh, in one degree increments. The red one is the center isentrope. Um, uh, we've chosen the parameters so that uh, that based on shallow water theory, you expect the hydro stationary lee side hydraulic jump to form. And you see from the uh, saw from the movie here that it, it does form and uh, makes the wake. Okay, so let's take a closer look. This is a look down the center line. Here, this is a full domain showing the flow coming up, going over the opposite. Line. You can see what happens here is that you're getting this uh, the, the warm air sinking down below. And 
curling up into these, these episodes of rotating motion. You can see the, the flow coming back. Every time one of these things breaks off and comes back, the flow comes back, and then it lifts the upper part of the layer, and you get vorticity of the opposite sign because now the baroclin baroclinicity uh, reverses through the fluid. This is the, uh, so the shaded uh, region is the, the azimuthal, I'm sorry, the, the Y component of the vorticity. This is the vorticity into the page, out of the page. So the blue is vorticity, if you use your right hand rule, curls around this way so the flow is coming back, and vorticity is pointing out, and at the top, flow is going like this, vorticity is pointing into the page. And right hand, the coordinate system, right? X, Y is into the page, Z is up. Okay, let's take a closer look. So now we're going to look at a, a limited domain over a limited stretch to get a better view. And now I'm going to add the uh, 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 a cross, a horizontal cross section, as you can see contemporaneous, contemporaneously. As you start peeling off these, these patches of negative vorticity here, uh, we start forming positives dominantly and negative vorticity in the vertical direction on both these sides. And just notice the episodic nature because uh, what we're going to do next is do the, do the, uh, the long-term average so we can look at the statistical steady state and then analyze the statistical steady state to see what happens on average. Uh, for to explain this, uh, to explain this flow, or the vorticity distribution of that flow. So this is the average. Uh, this, this is a two-hour simulation. This is the last hour uh, of uh, simulate. Uh, this is the last hour, and we performed an average here over the last hour. And you can see that on average, on average, there is a uh, <coughs> positive vorticity here. So this kind of rotation, negative vorticity, vertical vorticity here, like this, and importantly, negative vorticity here. This is still peeling off and uh, and, uh, and constantly uh, peeling off these episodes of strong negative vorticity. So uh, we'll move on to the, uh, the hard part now. Um, this is the equation for uh, vertical vorticity written in a flux form. Um, uh, I, I'll refer you to this paper. It's kind of a fundamental paper on uh, on uh, on this topic. But uh, it's important to emphasize here that this is exact. I, I didn't write the molecular term here just because I didn't want to clutter this, uh, this the slide. But this is an exact equation for the vertical vorticity. Uh, the uh, the zero here is that. The zero, the zero there is there because there can't be any uh, flux of vorticity in the direction of that, of that vorticity. I had a prop over here, actually. Let me take out my prop. Uh, this might mean something. Yeah, so what that means is that There we go. Everybody see this? Um, yeah, so, uh, so you see there's only horizontal derivatives. So there's only horizontal fluxes. There's no vertical flux of vertical vorticity. I wrote a paper once showing this, uh, but it got rejected. People said, but you're crazy. You're just playing with words. And uh, Michael McIntyre, years later, got wind of it. And he, he sent me a letter. And I, I sent him the reviews and the paper. And he says, oh, no, no they're wrong. You're right. And so if you go to this paper here, there's a footnote that acknowledges my unpublished uh, paper for this equation. But it's just this, it's that in order to create you know, the, the vorticity that points in the vertical direction like this, the only way you can create it is by horizontal forces you know, exercised in a, in a plane that's perpendicular to the, to the direction, to the vertical direction. And that's what those things are there. And the vertical, those fluxes in the horizontal direction are actually forces. You think of them as forces that change the vorticity by virtue of 
application of a horizontal force. I'll come back to the full board this is the equation in a minute. But first, let's just analyze this. So um, yeah, so those are the you know that's the exact vorticity equation. All the you know, mean and turbulence effects are in there. So when you uh, when you do the time average, and this is t statistically steady state, then uh, then you know the time derivative goes to zero, and uh, so we have a basically a, an x component of the flux and a y component of the flux, and if you plot that out, and and you plot. We're plotting just for the uh, just for one member because if we do it for the whole thing, but uh, the conservation of angular momentum will come out to zero, so it wouldn't, wouldn't tell us very much. So we do we just do for this part here. We're going to do do analysis of how this attains vertical vorticity. And uh, so what this tells you when you do this analysis that the flux the, is coming in from from its anti-symmetric pair over to here. So there's a flux into the domain across the center line axis. And that flux uh, is exited, is balanced by the flux out over here. So at a statistical steady state, this, this works out exactly. If you integrate around, around the box, then the integral of this out the, of, of the x flux out one side is equal to the y integral of, of, the, of the y flux. So it's, it's an exact statement. So one of the things we can do with a numerical model is uh, play. So what you find from this is when you do the calculation of the of just the, the average terms, time average average terms, that the Reynolds stress, you know, the Reynolds stress, the, the correlation terms don't amount to anything because, as you can see from here, they're almost identical. Furthermore, we played a little bit more and showed that the main con contributions are, are these, and that the this ve this vector here is coming from this term, w eta, the minus sign, and uh, and uh, and and the the flux flux here is dominated by just the, the usual effective flux. So what that we can do then is we can do an integral around the box. And then integral around the box uh, shows you that uh, this uh, flux of the of the vertical vorticity, you stop, you know, exiting on, out the box here, the vertical vorticity is precisely equal to uh, this term uh, W bar times eta bar. So the average W times the average eta. And we know that the average W on, on the lee side of the mountain here is you know, going down, it's negative. And the average eta, I've emphasized, is negative. So negative, negative is positive. The flow out of the domain is positive. It explains basically the positive vorticity is coming from the, the persistent uh, downward transport of negative uh, y directed vorticity and that's embodied in this term here okay so uh, I'm going to take a little I'm going to open a parenthesis here and that is to talk about the vorticity equation more generally and, and again the the derivation is in uh, is in this paper and it's, it's really kind of simple uh, but uh, if you haven't seen it before it's not simple but uh, any students or you want to see me later, I'll show you that it's one of these uh, things that you could, it's like a party trick and you could show, you could, you could amaze your friends and, and uh, say, look, I can derive this in three steps, you know. So I'll show you, I'll show you the trick later if you want to know it. Um, the, uh, the, you know, the, the y component of the vorticity equation is this, and you can see that it, it also has this property of the zero flux in the direction of the y component. There are only fluxes in the in the direction in the other direction. And again, the same principle. This is the baroclinic term. I, we write it on the right hand side just for uh, for uh, traditional purposes. But this this d by dx could be included in here. Uh, and uh, I'm, we're going to use this equation in the next sequence to explain where the eta comes from because we know from uh, here 
that we want to know where the eta comes from. So just to complete this, we write the x equation. And we notice these properties of the, the dynolent, the, the vorticity flux tensor given by these red terms. And you could include these baroclinic terms in the, the d by dy term in here, the d by dx term in here. It has a property of zero, uh, zero uh, diagonal elements and anti-symmetric in the, uh, and it's an anti-symmetric tensor. So, so this thing here we've been studying, which is the, uh, which is the y-directed flux of vertical vorticity, is the same as the as the vertical directed flux of the y directed vorticity. So just exchanging the exchanging the position of the adjectives gives you uh, the sense of a anti-symmetric flux tensor. All right, enough about that. So let's uh, go back to this. We want to explain the eta part here. And so we're going to go to the, uh, the eta equation. Now, if you remember from the movies, this part here is very, very steady. So the eta equation just basically reduces to a uh, simple advection equation. And uh, so we just advect a fluid parcel along here. And as it comes along, it, uh, sees, a, uh, it sees a gradient, a potential temperature gradient. Remember, it's, it's warm down this axis here, so it's d theta dx is a positive number. Uh, therefore, this is negative. So if we write this uh, sort of integrate along a streamline from here to here, it's the integrated effect of these this negative production. And so that's why there's negative vorticity here. And this is precisely the negative vorticity that goes into that, that uh, calculation of the vertical vorticity. Um, if we look downstream at this point, then we can see here's the turbulence. And here's where the, uh, the Reynolds stresses uh, come into play. Because as we go downstream in here, uh, basically, again, the, at a statistically steady state, given the symmetrical obstacle, uh, there, there's no mean flow, there's no V bar. So we basically have just uh, the flux of, uh, you know, the effective flux of, uh, of, of wide directed vorticity is balanced by basically the Reynolds stresses. So we see that when we compute this integral here, we only have the W, the w negative and the eta negative part, but there's, no, there's, no, there's nothing to cancel it out downstream. So, so that's why we have a net, uh, a net spin, a net, net positive spin on the uh, vertical vorticity. Uh, sure. Thank you. So down here you have a D plate, but if you are exactly uh, a, a two-layer fluid, then you don't have the plate in the egg. You do not. Uh, I'll, I'm going to come to that at the end. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so at this point here, from from here to here, the state of the x is small. So. Okay. So the summary. Um, a uh, summary, basically, what the shallow water equation sees. You know, this. This, this feature here, this discontinuity, is, is, is trying to represent something like this. This is the actual, this is like looking inside uh, the discontinuity. You know, shallow water, oh, you only get one, one U and one H per, per station. So there's no way to look at hard, you know, uh, vertical variations of the horizontal velocity, only across the interface. So this is the actual internal structure I, I maintain. Uh, of the of this jump, and it says that the the, the hard the, the very persistent negative vorticity, negative uh, wide directed vorticity, and that's precisely what you need to explain uh, this vortex pair, because on average, all the vortex all the vorticity in here has come across this way, and so this uh, this vorticity. This wide directed vorticity is baroclinic. It's coming down the mountain, and it's being converted uh, into a vertical component by basically the tilting of uh, vortex lines on average in the uh, turbulent flow. So uh, coming back to this picture, this is not such a bad way to think about it. Uh, we haven't used uh, Ertel's theorem, haven't used conservation of uh, potential vorticity. This is just a straight analysis of the vorticity equation 
And it leads to these conclusions that the baroclinic vorticity equation, baroclinic production is the prime mover uh, for these vortices. And the conversion to the vertical, on average, through the turbulent flow, is the, uh, the mechanism for, uh, for uh, Lee vortices. Um, just a little bit of epilogue. So what about the PV? There was a uh, nice paper by Christoph Scher. They said, okay, well, in, the, uh, in these models where you, more generally speaking, you have an isotropic surface and you have a turbulent patch here, you'll get a, uh, you can write the potential vorticity equation like this. And this J vector basically uh, goes from the left side to the right side facing downstream uh, due to uh, turbulence in the wave, you know, frictional forces. And uh, so we looked at this in the model, in the, the simulation I showed you. And this is the potential vorticity. And yes, it has this positive, it has some negative. It does have a J vector that goes like this, as we show here. Um, but writing out the J vector, you can see that there's a frictional part and there's sort of a heat transfer part, as most people know who study this area. And this heat transfer part basically features prominently the W bar eta bar term. And when we divide these things up, we see that's a major piece of the, of the PV. So it kind of fits together with uh, the PV thinking and that, you know, the, the source of, this is the source of vorticity and when multiplied by the theta dz, it's, it's also the source of PV. Uh, finally, to your Edmund's uh, question, the shallow water theory. So if you look at shallow water theory, and you see know, the equations, you say, you know, where's the baroclinic production of vorticity? There's no, there's no variation of, uh, of theta in the solar layer. The only variation of theta occurs across, the, uh, across this point. And so the reason why the shallow water theory is kind of complicated to interpret in terms of the the full equations of motion is because you've got two discontinuities. There's a discontinuity to start with because of the two-layer flow, but there's also a discontinuity that forms in the horizontal of this two-layer flow. And so uh, one way to think about, uh, and, and, and yeah, so this is shallow water theory. So, so unless you, you, know, you look at it and say that there's no eta, there's no, there's no horizontal vorticity in here. So, it, so most people who would would answer who do GFD would say, well, it's implicit. It's in the uh, it's in it's in the, the surface that separates the two the two densities. So uh, then, but then they'll say, well, well, what about the density goes to zero in the upper layer, like in actual water air systems? It's very very small. Is that still true? That there's vorticity in the you know in the layer? And the answer is yes, it's still true. Uh, there's uh, these authors here, many years ago, uh, solved uh, the water weight equations. You know, most of you, I don't know, most of you, I did, uh, learned water weight theory under, under the following assumptions. It's basically potential flow, omega zero, beneath the surface of the water, and you have dynamic conditions of pressure and displacement at the, at the, at the top. And so uh, that's the way we're taught water weight theory. But another way of understanding water weight theory is to envision the surface of the water as a, as a sheet of uh, vorticity that can change in, in strength and, and distribution in time. And these authors did the, uh, the, the simulation showing uh, the wave about to break. And so uh, you could ask the question, well, what happens if this wave comes all the way around to here and all these little positives are, are, are are circled with by fluid. Because you know, by, by classical fluid dynamics, if I take any little circuit in here, and there's no vorticity, I have no circulation, right? And then so, you know, and even if I take a little circuit in here, there's no circulation, right? But if, uh, if the circuit, the way it comes back, kind of touches itself like this, now I can find, now I can find a circuit that goes like this. And oh, the circulation, All right? So uh, yeah, if you don't understand it this way, you'd say, well, okay, there's going to be circulation, right? There's obviously circulation. The flow's coming up and it's coming down, and you can tell me there's no circulation, there's no vorticity in here until this point hits this point, and I'd say, well, no, there's, uh, there is circulation. It's in the free surface, and uh, it doesn't get into the fluid until 
no, sur no surfaces touch. And if you don't believe that, you can ask this guy here. Which, uh, he's a <laughs> this is actually a, a danger for uh, people who design, uh, just getting back to engineering roots. This is just, in uh, engineering, uh, this reverse roller is a, uh, it's called a grounding machine. So uh, I maintain that this is coming from the vorticity in the free, in effect, in the free surface, developing as you go down the hill and rolling this way. So that's, uh, that's all I have. Yes. Why do we, we use a smooth, uh, smooth, smooth surface after the flow? After the flow, with that same to occur, we just add some uh, smooth, uh, smooth boundary, but it's sloped after. Yes. Yeah, so oh, the, this this is actually this is this is a result. It's so so this is a very high Reynolds number flow, right? So yeah. it means that there's a, there's a thin laminar boundary layer in here that gets even thinner because the flow is accelerating as yes. you go. And then as you get to this point, now the flow is slow, slowing down. Yes. And now it, the flow separates. And in this point here, this is where all the sand and junk gets deposited in the, because there's a laminar boundary there underneath. But as you can see, the sense of this rotation here would be opposite to the sense of a viscous separation. The viscous boundary really separates this way. Yeah. The yeah, same question, I'm sorry. The separation of the full layer model, uh, I noticed that the seed are separating, separating from the other one set to just over here. The horizontal after this after flow through the 3D obstacle looks like it's lower in vertical than the previous one. Is that a, is that a I mean here? Yeah, there's separation line over here. Right. There. Right. Oh, it looks like a little lower than Oh here, yeah, yeah. Because um, yeah. Because the the actual complete story is that in order to, to, to match conditions at infinity, it takes other adjustments. This is just one of the adjustments uh, through here, is it go going from uh, at the crest, the, fruit, the, the critical fruit number reaches one, super critical, and then it has to adjust the conditions downstream. And so it goes through a jump, you know, some state that's compatible between these two states, but the new state may not be compatible with conditions further downstream. And what this is, this is a, a rarefaction wave that goes downstream and starts adjusting things downstream. So that's a stable, like a, uh, no example, like a waterfall. Mm -hmm. You say it's, it's uh, laminar flow on that super critical. Yeah, so if it's more from a waterfall, pretty turbulent, it's not going to train a lot of that surface water and just drag it down. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sh quite. Sh I, I don't quite know your vision, actually. I mean, if, it, if the surface becomes vertical, yeah, yeah, vertical. yeah. Um, right. Well, wh where did where did this uh, where did, where did the basic rotation come from? It, it would be my question. I, I, I say here, it's a, you can envision it that it's in it's in here. Is it that it, if, if you had a viscous layer here, you tend to separate the other way because you, the, the flow the flow slows down near the hill and then goes up like that. But this tendency to always rotate this way um, is connected, I believe, to the to the. I, mean, I think a beautiful example is a New Zealand's biggest river. Mm -hmm. Well, that Lake Taupo is a little more fun, and there's these falls, the Book of Falls. Yeah. Yeah. Waterfalls are uh, they're, 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 they have special they have they're, they're kind of special cases. Yeah. But waterfall, I know Peter. Like a dam, like a dam, like an overflow of a dam. Yeah. They kind of they're kind of. Um, they're, yeah. They have some some. You know, the vertical wall cases is kind of a special case, and I could point you like Peter Baines's book uh, discusses uh, shallow water flow over over a, a waterfall and there's some there's some special in there so, some odd things that happen you know in these limits Any other questions?
questions? I'm just curious about, curious about the um, <coughs> atmospheric observations. You mentioned the miracle run flow over the, the rock, but I mean, has there been any field programs or observations looking to lead that kind of yeah. Yeah, like in the Hawaii case, is a big field program. Um, you know, the Hawaii, Hawaiian Island experiments. Um, well, I think I showed it. So they had yeah. LIDAR and other things. Yeah, but the thing, you know, the thing is that there's always, there, there are always boundary, there are always boundary effects. You can't do, uh, yeah. but one of the things that, that's a telltale, uh, uh, telltale uh, thing in favor of the, of the, uh, of the baroclinic mechanism is that the, um, is that you always see this, the clouds clearing out, and that that's that is sort of an indication of downward motion. Let's see, there we go. Uh, that's that back at the beginning. Yeah, like this one, for example. Yeah, there's always sort of a clearing that goes along with the vortex, and that, and that says that, well, that it says that, that there's downward motion, and that suppresses clouds. And so it, if it was just a matter of a two-dimensional separation of a stratified flow around a more or less vertical cylinder, then, then you wouldn't expect, yeah? So I have a question. So the horizontal scale, and so the, the size of these vortices, Have you done like sensitivity experiments with the numerical model? Yeah, yeah, it does. You know, the, the horizontal scale means the span-wise. Yeah, that depends on the span-wise extent of the uh, of the obstacle, but the, to a certain extent, because then they become localized around. The, I mean, we made a very range, long. What about the other the other like scale though? In terms, it's of not that sensitive to that because uh, uh, the shallow water theory teaches you that. Um, the teacher. Yeah. Well, I, I have some slides here. I don't want to go back to it, but but basically, if you take you know a mountain like this, you shut you know, you shut and you put the you if you look at a time dependent problem, the shallow water theory. Uh, what happens is that the the characteristics from this side of the obstacle start heading. Uh, in, you know, sort of upstream, and they start colliding with the characteristics that are emanating off the, the obstacle here. And that comes from the long wave theory. They're not particularly um, uh, sensitive to the shape of the mountain in, this, in the uh, long flow direction. But so it's the long wave theory doesn't care about really. But they would be sensitive about the height of the mountain. The height of the mountain, yes. And yes. So, but the height of the mountain, will that impact then the horizontal scale of the lead vortices? Well, they, they'll either be there or not be there okay. with the, uh, the height of the mountain. There's two parameters. In shallow water theory, there's two. Let me just go. I'll go through a couple of slides on that. Uh, this might be the quickest way there. Actually, no, it's not the quickest way. I'll get out. Right, so uh, this is uh, kind of what I was drawing there. This is these. I have the. This is a two-dimensional calculation. Time, time zero is here, and uh, you know the height of the mountain, HM, divided by the the ratio of the height of the inversion to the height of the mountain, and the uh, the fruit number, which is. The, the velocity of the fluid divided by the square root of g prime times the height of the h naught, so the fluid velocity of the layer, the wave velocity. Uh, those two parameters control whether or not there'll be a hydraulic jump forming. And these are the these are the character. I, I mapped out the characteristics here. These are the upstream in red moving characteristics starting here and moving upstream. 
these are the downstream moving characteristics uh, in blue. And uh, you have a problem here when the upstream moving characteristics start colliding at this point. And that's when you form the uh, hydraulic jump at the, uh, that's when you have to do something. You have to say, okay, either I quit or uh, <laughs> I give up. Or you say, oh, well, let me fit. Let me do a shock fitting or hydraulic. You, know, you fit, you fit the, uh, the jump in there and then continue your calculation. Yeah, and so it, there's only two bit. And the, the horizontal scale doesn't, doesn't come into it. And I, I've tested it out in this model here and make the horizontal scale a lot bigger. It, it still happens at the, when, you, when, you, when you specify the height of the inversion and the, uh, the velocity and put it in the same way. Okay, well, let's, let's thank Dr. Gutierrez. Lunch and yeah, after lunch at around 145, please, uh, students, meet with uh, Dr. Ricciuto, tell you a bunch of things and car and so forth, if you're interested. So please meet with him. Uh, that's it. Okay,